Well, hello, folks. Welcome to our 2015 update of Wave Division Multiplexing from NOS LLC. Uh, sounds like we're going to drown here. I better get out of the waves. Um, this is an update of an uh, earlier one that we had done. Um, we're trying to get all of our material into the same uh, visual format. So that's part of the reason for uh, re uh, releasing this one and also uh, add a little bit more information than uh, we did in the very first one. So here we go. Uh, loose tutorial structure. Um, very loose. Uh, the generalities of multiplexing. We can do this with electronics, with photonics, and uh, with uh, radio systems, magnetomites. Hmm been using these little cartoon characters for a long time and uh, we'll probably continue to use them because they're kind of fun to draw. Uh, then we'll look at some generalities of uh, optical transmission um, because you will not see the light. <laughs> no matter how hard you try you can't see this light. Then uh, the actual multiplexing process which is really nothing more than uh, stacking things up. Right? You just stack stuff up. We've been doing it for a long 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 time. The process itself um, provide a plentitude of people on a dearth of plant. Plant being the just kind of general name for the hardware. Outside plant, inside plant. It's a term we use in the phone company all the time. And what is the purpose of multiplexing is to reduce the cost of the plant via transmission plant efficiency. Meaning I'm going to put a whole bunch of people on uh, just a little bit of transmission path. It's a lot cheaper that way because everybody shares the cost of uh, putting it in and maintaining it. And what is the path? Well, uh, we've been using wire forever, which requires electronics. Um, we're using glass now, have been for quite a few years, which requires photonics or photomites, and uh, radio systems, which need those little magnetomites. So what are we really doing in multiplexing? We're putting a whole bunch of customers on a, a limited uh, transmission facility. We don't need a separate transmission facility for each one of these to get over to each one of these. We can combine them together, otherwise known as multiplexing. So in this case, I can put all these people through this uh, muffin multiplexer and send them out on one fiber or one cable or one p piece of twisted pair depending on what kind of multiplexer I'm using and how much information I need to send from here to there. And then of course the other side, they want to respond back so I've got another path over here. Right? Now it could be the same path. In some instances uh, I can do this on one single twisted pair. I can use two single uh, two uh, twisted pairs. I can use uh, two radio channels. Right? Uh, I can use uh, two fibers, right? a fiber going this way and a fiber going this way. And, but in some instances I can use one fiber. Right? I can send both ways on the same fiber. So basically what I'm trying to do is get a whole bunch of people onto a limited uh, transmission facility because it makes this thing cheaper because I share the cost over many customers. So it's been the name of the game for a hundred and some years and it's still the name of the game. <clears throat> Now, the evolutionary uh, process of wave division multiplexing. Big surprise to a lot of people, it's just another name for FDM, frequency division multiplexing. It's the oldest and least complicated parallel because we're going to put everybody out there at the same time on the facility, either wire or radio system. All right? Or when we get to wave division multiplexing on the same fiber. All right? So I'm sending them simultaneously several information streams on this single wire or wireless path. So here's an example. When you tune to a, a radio station, and I've given you a couple of things here, AM radio or FM radio, you're pulling out from a, a, a stack of frequencies here, the particular one that you want to listen to. Now there's a complete map of the radio spectrum at this location right here. It's a government document. You can go out and get it. It's pretty cool. Uh, I have just a little piece of it right here to show you that the radio spectrum, they they've designated in orange, um, is not what we're going to be using for fiber optics. Uh, and it also is not visible because you can't see the stuff. It's really going to be down in here. So it's still, I guess, considered to be uh, optical, right? Even though you can't see it, unless you got special equipment, of course. So uh, if you want the whole, um, the whole drawing, uh, go out there to this location. It's really cool. It's a gigantic drawing. I just took the little part at the bottom down here and kind of blew it up. 
Well, actually, it's orange, not blue. Uh, why, uh, wave division multiplexing, the low-tech version wave division. We're calling that sounds fancy, doesn't it? But it's just uh, the same thing we've been doing forever. Uh, when you tune your radio here and you want to listen to classical, you tune to a you know particular frequency, new age, different frequency, easy listening, talk radio, and so on. Basically, these are like a stack of pancakes, right? Mm -hmm. Right here, stack of uh, frequency-filled pancakes. They all exist at the same time. They're they're around us right now, even as I speak to you. They are here. They're going in and out your ears and all kinds of stuff. You don't even know it, huh? Um, so the only real difference between this and wave division is the the frequencies. Or when you get the wave division, fiber optic systems, they talk wavelengths and stop talking frequencies. But they're the same thing, right? We just have a a fancy word for it now. Oh, it's a wavelength. Yeah, well, this is a wavelength too. Ta da. And here's some examples of uh, stuff we've been doing in the telephone industry forever. I worked on the tons of these things. Bring in 4 kilohertz voice, um, heterodyne it, beat it, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, jack each one of these things up to a different frequency and send it over a twisted pair cable right there. Um, and I've given you the uh, wavelength here, which we never, ever, ever did. We never talk wavelength on these things. We always talk the frequency, the you know, the channel number right here. So, so I'm analog in here, and I'm analog out. I'm just heterodyned, uh, you know, frequency division multiplex, uh, amplitude uh, modulated, frequency modulated, that like, like that. So I went in analog, I come out analog, and I'm going out on twisted pair. Now, uh, and I've shown you a picture of what they're talking about in wavelength right here. So I start from a zero value, go to some positive value, back to zero, down to some negative value, back to zero. That's one wave of all of these things, right? 256,000 cycles per second or waves per second. So this is the length of the meter, or length of, length of the wave in meters. So it's just an easier way to talk about it over here to say it's the channel frequency rather than the wavelength. We just never did that. Um, move over here to a um, more uh, higher capacity uh, carrier system, L-type carrier. We bring in our kilohertz channels, analog channels over here. Do the same thing we did over here, just a higher frequency, right? So mess those things up and get them all jacked up into these really really higher frequencies and once again I've given you the meters here the only difference basically between this and this is that this works on fi on uh, um, coaxial cable it's a better transmission facility for these higher frequencies than twisted pair right but it's still analog in analog out and we're still talking about kilohertz out here and kilohertz in here and kilohertz here and just you know kilohertz here analog stuff frequency stuff Ooh. moving up in the uh, frequency range uh, we'll look at uh, I've given you here FM radio frequency uh, modulated radio so we bring in a you know a talk radio dude talking about something I don't know who knows what they talk about I seldom listen to that stuff um, so I bring in a, an analog signal over here, and I heterodyne it in here in the FM radio, and I come out with a analog signal over here, a waveform, right? That's running someplace between 88 and 108 megahertz. And now, once again, I've given you the meter spec. I guess when you start talking about radio, sometimes lots, of, you know, lots of people talk about the, the the wavelength of it. But once again, after so many years in the industry, uh, we still talk about the, you know what the frequency is rather than the wavelength. And then you have this really weird thing that uh, popped up quite a few years ago and everybody kept talking about it. It's called digital radio. Well, in fact, it's a radio signal, so therefore it's a waveform coming out over here. It's just that we modify it in such a way that it can transport digital information. And we've been doing that in modems forever. So uh, basically what this is, is the radio that has a modem in front of it, all right? So it can take, uh, anyway, digital radio. Yeah, it is digital radio because it'll take digital. It'll send digital information by modifying the outgoing analog waveform. 
Uh, and then finally, we'll move over here to our light type carrier systems, our fiber optic systems. And you'll notice there was a change here. I have digital input right here in bits per second. I'm not talking about inputs in kilohertz. I'm talking about inputs in bits per second. So we ha this has to be converted. If it's an analog thing like a voice signal, it has to be converted into digital. If it's a digital signal already, it probably is still going to have to get modified so it's in the proper digital uh, form uh, to be able to s uh, be sent over this fiber optic. And then out here on this side, you notice I have both. I have analog and digital output on a glass fiber. Right? This was radio free space and the other ones were wire, but this is glass. Now how can I have both analog and digital? Well, that's the wavelength division uh, multiplexing we're talking about is that Originally, all of these fiber systems just do this. They just pulse digital. You know, I got a bits per second coming in, and I got a bazillion bits per second going out because I'm multiplexing a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, so I have digital going out, on, off, on, off, on, off. But as soon as I start using different, um, I'm going to tell you colors at this point, but they're not colors because you can't see them. But uh, if I stack uh, frequencies up or wavelengths up, and uh, send them out in parallel, each one of which is pulsed in digital, then I have a combination, don't I? I have analog and digital over here in wavelength division multiplexing. I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, going this way. But first, once again, I want to make sure you have this in your, in your head, in your uh, kind of visual uh, picture of what's going on. I'm showing you the visual light spectrum over here, you know, red, orange, and so on. These are the colors that you can see with your eyes. Um, and this is the wavelength right here, right? Nanometers now, not meters. And this is the frequency, terahertz over here. So now, even though you can't see these over here, because these are the bands in fiber optic systems, they're not visible. But you can think of them the same way as this. As these wavelengths right here, you can see are different. So they correspond kind of in a general format to color, 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 right? Kind of like this over here, right? But uh, we're talking in uh, wavelengths now, not uh, frequencies. Almost nobody ever talks about the frequencies o over here. And we seldom talk about them over here either, but um, we certainly do in our radio systems and our uh, wire systems. So what I'm telling you then is the bands, each one of these bands can be collectively sub-multiplexed into as many as 72 in dense wavelength division multiplexing uh, and these parallel channels on a single fiber. So you can, you can send terabits uh, of information if you consider that you can pulse each one of these and you can you know, put a lot of them together. Uh, this gets really quite impressive in terms of being able to carry digital um, bit streams. Now, I'm giving you just the two, just the highest, highest part of the iceberg here. Um, if you want to go deeper into this, um, go out and find this, the Fiber Optic Association site. They have a ton of information. It's really, really good. Um, spent a lot of time uh, looking at a lot of stuff on the net that is just not worth uh, clicking the mouse on. This is not one of them. So you might want to go and take a look at this right here. All right, so what is the generality generality of uh, optical transmission? Uh, this really tends to torque off my high-tech friends, but basically it's a light bulb and a photo detector at the other end. So what we do is take electronics and turn them into photonics, right? And we pulse a light on and off, and then at the other end we count the pulses with a, a detector. So And then coming back in, of course, we'll have this coming this way, we'll have pulses of light they get picked up by not a light bulb but a photo detector and then turned back into electronics. So all the multiplexing is uh, really done back here in terms of the electronics. right? And then we'll either uh, pulse a red light or a blue light or a green light. Remember you can't see them. I'm just telling you that as a way to think of it. So we pulse a red or a green and blue and do that all on one fiber. It's called wavelength division multiplexing but it's still being multiplexed electronically back here in the electronics. And here's an example of a simple on off on off, you know, the binary stuff, ones and zeros. So I've got an electrical signal coming in here into this transceiver, transmitter receiver, goes both ways, right? Sends out a pulse and it can receive a pulse of light and sends out a pulse and can receive a pulse of uh, electricity voltage on off. 
So here's my voltage signal on, off, on, off, representing a 0, 1, 0, 1. And all I really do is I just turn the light on, right? So it's 0 over here, the light's off. It's a 1 over here, the light gets turned on. 0, the light gets turned off, like that. Uh, I thought this was interesting. I haven't found anything uh, newer than this. I'm sure that it's out there someplace, but you can spend your life searching for information like this and uh, wear your finger out clicking the mouse on lots of worthless stuff. Um, the shortest laser pulse in 2011 was like this, femtoseconds, oh man, and they're talking about soliton pulses, and I thought, wow, that's kind of cool, it's a new word. What's a soliton? It's a really short pulse of light that has this almost magical property that the, the trailing edge of the pulse moves faster than the leading edge of the pulse. It basically run, overruns itself. Uh, kind of strange, huh? Um, and because the the trailing edge catches up with the leading edge, it actually adds, so it it's, makes this pulse stronger. Uh, oh man, that 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 tech is way beyond my understanding. Uh, way too much math on that one. So uh, what are we doing here then uh, in this multiplexing process? Well. Uh, in the case of Wavelink, we're doing a multiple set. So I've got uh, customers up here. This is just one. There'd be gazillions of them coming in here. Uh, and it's got digital pulses coming in here, and it pulses the light. So here's my pulses for this set of customers over here. On, off, on, off. Now it's red, green, and blue, but remember you can't see these things. So, so I'm pulsing red for this group of customers. I'm pulsing green for this group of customers. And look, I had an analog input, which meant that I had to digitize it through a coder decoder. Sample quantizing and code. T-type, E-type carrier, that stuff. Um, so maybe you want to go look at that and find out what in the world does this Kodak do? So now I've got a digital signal coming from a whole bunch of these people over here. And I pulse this green on, off, on, off, like that, and so on. So if I've just got uh, one uh, multiplexed, electrically multiplexed input over here, I just send out one, now red. But uh, when I start doing wavelength, I want to stack them up, right? So let's look at this, because I think this is really interesting. Um, there are four base properties of a carrier wave, because that's what light is. It's a wave. Actually, it's a wavicle, I guess. Sometimes a particle and sometimes a wave. but uh, too deep for us. Uh, so there are four base properties of a carrier wave that can be used to transport digital information. You can change the duration, frequency, amplitude, and or the phase. The duration is pretty straightforward. You just put the, the signal on and take it off. It's on and off. That's our one and zero. Um, in our electrical systems, we just we didn't do this after about the 1920s or something, we stopped doing it this way. Send a tone on and then take it off and then on and off. It's not very efficient in electronics to do it that way. Um, but when you're in fiber optics, that's the way it's done. <laughs> you have the light on and then it's off and then it's on and it's off. So you can change the duration of the signal, of the wave. You can change its frequency, go from a low frequency to a high frequency, you know. You've been doing that forever. Um, you can change its amplitude, uh, how loud it is. If it were a voice uh, uh, voice band where you could hear it, if you talk really loud, it's a lot bigger. And if you don't talk so loud, it's a lot smaller. You're changing the amplitude. Up here, if you change the frequency, you know, from high to low, like that, use that forever. Uh, and then there's this other thing called phase right here. Now, if I were to take this little part of this signal right here, snap it off right there and then rotate it around and click it on here guess what i would have drawn a circle so there's 360 degrees in a circle right right or a cycle of a waveform well down here what i've done is i instantaneously shifted from up here down to here that's a 180 degree phase shift now, you can't do this in voice systems no, it doesn't work people can't phase change their voice well, we can do this, and we can do this, and we can do this. But when you get into electronics, you can do this. So a shift of phase can represent a piece of dig digital information. And not only that, uh, for many years, and uh, I'm wondering if they're actually doing it in commercial systems in fiber, uh, if you combine two of these together, phase and amplitude, you can represent a whole bunch of bits uh, with one shift. 
one baud. A baud is the number of signal element changes or shifts, right? Whereas a bit is an on or off. It's a one or a zero. But if you combine a bunch of bits together, you create what's known as a baud. All right, so this signal element shift right here is a baud. It can represent one bit or a number of bits, depending on the way the system's put together. So let's look at this. Our simple on-off system is really you know, the way the fiber is actually pulsed. Is the, the the light is off, it represents a zero. When the light is on, it represents a one. Right. So zero, one, zero, one. Now you might say, well, how would I send a couple of zeros, you know, in sequence? So let's do this. I go one zero one zero one zero 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 one zero one zero one one one. You see, there's a timing aspect uh, involved. Uh, as soon as you get into any kind of digital system, you got to really, really be concerned about timing, right? So the receiver would be clocked so that it would know the time intervals that the ones and the zeros are supposed to come in. If we got two uh, time intervals with nothing coming in, it would say, oh, I got two zeros. Now, here's where we're going to do this combining of phase and amplitude changes right here. And it's uh, represented by the 16 state diagram. It's called quadrature amplitude modulation. Because in this one, uh, our output signal can vary in either f uh, phase or uh, amplitude. So right here at my zero point, you can see I've got a, a phase angle right here, and one right here, right, and one right here, so right here. So depending on the combination of the phase angle and the amplitude value, this one's a lower amplitude than that one. So those four sections right here give me 16 uh, points, doesn't it? Four here, four, eight. 12, 16. That's the 16 quam. So I can represent four bits at a time by the specific uh, amplitude and phase uh, uh, that the receiver uh, detects right here. So I get f I get uh, with one baud, one phase amplitude shift. I get four bits. Pretty cool. And once again, we've been doing this forever in our uh, wire systems, uh, in our old modems. We started doing this way back in the 60s using a phase and an amplitude. Now why do I bring this up right here? Well, it's because I've been looking and looking and looking to see if in fact there are any commercial systems in fiber optics that do this, that use uh, 16 QAM. Um, I know that they've got lots of them in the labs, but I haven't been able to find any place that specifically states they're doing uh, quam on um, fiber optic systems. I wouldn't be surprised, and maybe some of you know that the, those are in fact in commercial applications right now rather than just uh, laboratory applications, but I know they're doing it. So, what is the device that makes the light and accepts the light thing we were talking about? It's known as a transceiver. It's not a fancy name for this particular thing. It's just a common name, a transceiver. It's a transmitter receiver. In this case, though, it's uh, taking electrical signals that are on this uh, plug-in uh, back here and converting them into light that comes out over here right, for our fiber optic. So one of the fibers may be the transmit, and the other one would be the receive. It depends on the particular unit the transceiver right here. Uh, this one is uh, known as a small form pluggable. There's a little tiny thing. This gives you the dimensions of it right here. And it just plugs into a slot in something like a you know, a router or a switch or a file server. Something like that. Basically, it's a light bulb in a photo detector. And there you go. Boy, I know there's a bunch of fiber people going, oh man, that guy's just making it way too simple. Well, at the highest level, it is simple. Um, lots of different kind of connectors. Um, I just drew two pictures of two types, but uh, there's the fiber right here, the, gla the glass that the light goes in and out of right there. All right. And then, of course, you have to plug it into something, so the little uh, units can plug into these different kinds of boxes, uh, test panels or access panels. Right, and so the fiber would be connected here and go out to wherever, you know, to the next box maybe or to another one that uh, connects to large cables that leave the building, something like that. 
these are basically kind of like patch panels in the old uh, wire world. You know, same idea. Now, three kinds of fiber, step, graded, and single mode. Basically, that just means that this is a big fiber and lots of beams can launch in and they bounce around inside like inside of a chrome pipe. And this one over here is a little bit more like your glasses. It uh, kind of bends the light uh, beams so that they tend to get here a little bit more cohesively. Um, because the receiver has to have a certain number of photons before it says, oh, that's an on pulse or that's an off pulse. Right. Well, this over here, they kind of get here, you know, if they're launched all at the same time, which they are, um, but they don't all get here at the same time because some of them are bouncing more times than others. Uh, down here, they tend to get bent rather than bounced. And in single mode, they just choom, straight through here so they don't bounce around like they do over here. So you can pulse this kind of single mode fiber much higher bit rates because you don't have this thing called pulse spreading. And here's some uh, multi-mode um, spec. And once again, if you go to that uh, website I told you about, you get tons and tons more information about this and the kind of fibers and what they're made of and, uh, you know, they're all, all kinds of things, signal loss values, all that techie stuff that you may be interested in and you can find at that website. It's a very good one. Um, so what is this stuff? Well, the, the fiber that's carrying the light here is relatively large, 62.5 mics. Uh, this one is a little smaller, 50 mics, right, the graded index. And here's a picture of just one kind of uh, cable here. There's lots and lots of different kinds. So this got multi-fibers in it. You notice they've got uh, kind of a rubber stuff around them that's color-coded. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We've been doing that in wire systems for years. And then this little tiny stuff here, I'm hoping that the video is clean enough so that you can see this little tiny white thing right here. Well, that's not the center fiber. That's this outer cladding. When you grab a hold of this right here, you're grabbing the outer cladding. So the fiber that's carrying the light is inside there. You know, it's really tiny. You, you can't see this stuff. I try to do a little uh, uh, animation here to show you the step index uh, and the spreading that occurs in the step index. Let's see if it'll run here. Let's see. Okay, there they go. All the... Uh, all the beams were launched at the same time because it's so big. Some of them came in like this, you know, boink, boink, and some of them came in like this, boink, 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 like that. So you end up with spreading. They don't get here all collectively at the same time. So the little detector over here has to say, okay, I got a few, I got a few, I got a, oh, okay, now that means the light's on, right? Whereas graded index down here, let's see if I can get this one to run. It, they're going to go more like this rather than boink, boink, boink. They're going to kind of go ooh, 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 like that. Oh, I've never heard them actually do that. Ooh, ooh, ooh. there it goes. Oh, oh, oh. oh, he disappeared for a second. Um, so it's hard to tell because my animation is so ratty, but uh, these tend to get here pretty much uh, pretty much at the same time compared to what it is over here. So one would expect that you could pulse this a little bit higher bit rate because they'd have less spreading um, in the uh, receive uh, pulse. Whereas you go to single mode, it's tiny, 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 you know, six, eight. It's really tiny. That's why I said if you could see this little uh, th part right here, that fiber that carrying the light is actually inside of this cladding. So when you grab a hold of this cladding, it's it's this part. And I know you can't see this, but um, I try to take a photograph of this little paper thing I got years and years ago at a trade show, and it has just this little part right here, the cladding with the fiber inside of it, uh, all wrapped up uh, around here. And it looks like about three pound test fishing line. That's what this stuff looks like right here. So it has to be strongly reinforced by this Kevlar stuff and then inside of like the rubber jacket right here. So it's well protected. But the, this part right here, this gray part right here with the fiber inside of it is this little three pound test fishing line. Really interesting stuff. And then I had, uh, once again, I carried this around for years and years. This is one of the very early patch cables, and it's a real early one, too. I'd really be surprised if anybody has any of this left. Um, but um, basically, this is a, it's a patch cord. So you can you know, change things around on the patch panels using that. And then finally, uh, the example here, I've got a little ball here with a red and a 
green and a blue, right? Representing all three of those things we were looking at before. And it goes straight through, no bouncing. So you can get very high bit rates on this because uh, the receiver recognizes right away, oh, that's the edge of a pulse. Now it's off. Now it's on. Now it's off. So you can pulse these things at unbelievable bit rates. This becomes just almost hard for a human to understand how short these duration pulses are. So how do you go about uh, fixing some of this stuff and checking some of this stuff? Uh, electronics I've been doing for, you know, 40 years, almost 50 years. Um, very familiar with that, but uh, when you get into fiber optics, how do you how do you do some basic tests? How do you know you have continuity from one uh, one patch panel to another? Well, here's one way to do it: you use a flashlight. Only it's a high tech flashlight. They have a fancy name for it: a visual fault locator. Basically, what it is is a flashlight with a red beam, and you attach the fiber to this end, and you go to the other end and see if it's red coming out the end of that fiber, because you cannot see the uh, working uh, optics. Uh, as a matter of fact, they'll warn you over and over and over again, even when they're on, you can't see that, so you never want to look in a fiber if you're not absolutely certain that it's not running signal. Um, but this, this is visual, 650 red light, so it's a $500 flashlight basically that's what it is and then this other thing down here it's a time domain reflectometer only this time it's in the optical range we've been using TDMs um, for a long time on cable systems you launch a signal on the cable and if there's any kind of you know impairments or in uh, continuity problems you'll get a reflection back like a radar set Basically, that's what this thing is, only it's using a pulse of light rather than a pulse of electricity. Um, so if you get a reflection back, it means you've got maybe a bad splice or a piece of cable, a fiber that's bad. Like I said, we've been using uh, TDRs, and I said TDM, huh? TDRs uh, for that purpose in electronics for a long, long time, uh, but now they've got them in optical. And this is a $10,000 little box you can hold in your hand. but. Uh, uh, TDRs are, man, they're really indispensable. Before that, uh, as a matter of fact, I even have a video on this. We had to use uh, Wheatstone bridges to try to figure out where problems were on our cables. Uh, as soon as they came out with uh, TDRs, uh, got a lot easier to figure out where there were problems out in the, out in the field someplace, outside plant. You know? So $10,000 little meter, and uh, I guess if you're doing lots of fiber optic testing, this is well worth the, the problem or the uh, cost. Uh, interesting to note, though, that both these units only do terminated tests. You're going to actually have to pull the fiber off, so you can't do this on a working system. You, you've got to, uh, you know, launch a signal on a fiber, and you can't be having customers on it at the same time. I found no place, any place ever, anywhere so far that suggests in any way, shape, or form that you can do bridged testing on fiber systems. Now some of you who are you know, watching this video saying what an idiot, he doesn't know anything. Um, if you know of a way to do a bridge test on a fiber optic system I'd sure be interested in knowing about it because uh, we've been doing it in, in electrical systems forever. You, you have little monitor jacks you can do that you don't have to break the system open but these two tests for certain you have to break the system open. I don't know if there's any way to do the testing at the fiber, not at the electronics. All right, get that straight. You can do all kinds of testing at the electronic side, the back side, uh, at the multiplexing, electronic multiplexing side, but I don't know of anywhere, any place you can do it in the fiber itself. And then finally, in the electronic side, uh, we've been doing this forever also, is that when you launch a digital signal into a transmission facility, the signal is very clean. You got a clean, sharp edge on the on off, on off, on off. So the pulses are really, they're not quite square, but uh, close enough um, that we can say they're square when they go in right here. But when they come out, they're not square. And why is that? Because your transmission facility is inducing problems in it. Um, and in this case, let's say you had a delay in here because you're launching these uh, light beams that are bouncing around like in this, right? Uh, so what will happen is you'll have a spreading, the pulses at the receive side after they've been brought in back into electronics can be looked at with an oscilloscope and um, it's what we call um, 
eye patterns because over here you can see that the uh, plus and minus plus and minus pulses over here the on offs on offs on offs they're very clean but over here they start rounding off and more than that is this is a uh, a, dyna a dynamic test so the pulse is coming in it's just not one you're getting bazillions of them coming in and some of them if they're messed up will start jumping here you know or jumping here right like that so you have this jiggling thing and the eye on this because that's what they're talking about the eye it looks like an eyeball this eyeball starts closing down because some of the pulses are too short or too long or too garbaged up with noise or you know whatever so when the the eye starts closing down it indicates to you that something is wrong with your transmission facility right here so if you ever hear anybody talk about eye patterns uh, and you're not familiar with the, the fact we've been doing this forever in electronics you might think it has something specifically to do with the fact that this is optical right an eye an optical not true um, this eye pattern is just uh, what's the pulses what's the whole bunch of the pulses look like when they're coming out of the uh, uh, electronic side of it after they're turned back turned back into electronics so that's what they're talking about this eye closes down you got problems because it was nice and open in the in the transmission side but it's all messed up over here you got something wrong in your transmission system so this is really really deep tech I keep making light of it it's a you know it's a light bulb in a photo cell which is you know true at the high level but this is some deep deep tech this is really really complicated stuff it's particularly when you start start talking about the kinds of fibers and you know all the impairments that can take place and so on but um, the concepts is very simple and it's so simple that in fact in 1880 Bell got a patent for the photophone and he sent his voice over a beam of light and this is a direct quote from him the greatest invention I have ever made greater than the telephone unfortunately it took a uh, hundred and some years to get to a system that really could work uh, but hey who's in a hurry okay there you go thanks for watching we got a lot of other uh, kind of related videos I talked about multiplexers uh, t-type and e-type carrier system it's a good place for you to start if you're not familiar with it um, multiplexing electronic side because that's what you have to do before you start pulsing this fiber so you might find some other stuff um, and you're gonna no doubt find some more of these updated versions of our really early uh, videos so thanks for watching uh, 10 for Roger rubber ducky over and out